and welcome to High School Physics Explained and today I'm going to start the first in a series of videos which looks at the development of our understanding of the atom and today I'm going to concentrate on Rutherford's gold foil experiment. But before we go on we need to just briefly look over J.J. Thompson's work of 1897. You may have studied this before, but J.J. Thompson is responsible for the discovery of the electron through his study of cathode rays. As a result of his studies and his discovery of the electron, he came up with a model which was often referred to as a plum pudding model. And I'll go and explain it briefly. But in essence, basically what it amounted to was a large sphere of a positive region embedded within it were his electrons that he had discovered. And so we have here, we have our electrons, and here we have our positive sphere. Now, that model was a very rudimentary model, and even before we continue with Rutherford's experiment, which ultimately nullified this model, there were already a number of scientists who had doubts about this particular model. But it's referred to the plum pudding model simply because it looks a bit like a plum pudding with raisins embedded into this pudding. So now let's have a look at Rutherford. And before we continue on, we need to understand that although it is referred to as the Rutherford Gold Fall experiment, it is really actually known as Geiger and Marsden's experiment simply because Rutherford was actually the supervisor for the experimentations of Geiger and Marsden. And a little brief of history, Rutherford was studying uh, radiation and he was the one who first discovered alpha particles. Now, what wasn't known at the time what an alpha particle was, except that it was a, a large uh, particle with a positive charge to it. But when firing these alpha particles through a gas, they discovered that often the alpha particles were deflected by the molecules and he was particularly interested in determining the charge to mass ratio. So he got Geiger and Marsden, who was an undergrad student, to set up an experiment to fire these alpha particles at some gold foil and to see uh, how the gold foil deflected the alpha particles and hopefully determine a bit more of the properties of the alpha particles. And these experiments were done in between 1908 and 1913. This is the experiment here. So here we have our alpha emitter, so some sort of radioactive source that's releasing these alpha particles, and they're passing through a slit, and then they hit a very thin piece of gold foil, only a few atoms thick. What happened is, is that these alpha particles will be deflected or not deflected, and they would hit this screen here, and this screen, this purple screen, is simply zinc sulfide, what happened was is the alpha particles would cause a little bit of, because of the positive charge, would cause a little scintillation, a little bit of a bright spot. So by knowing and recording the bright spots onto the screen, they knew how much the alpha particles were deflected by the atoms of the gold foil. So that's your detecting screen. So here is basically the results that were, they were expecting. So I have my Again, my alpha emitter over here, it's striking the gold foil and these scintillations or these bright sparks are appearing. And the expectation was, if this was the model of the atom, that the vast um, number of alpha particles would pass through this positive region. And occasionally they may be slightly deflected by the negative charges that are within this plum pudding model. So you would have a very large proportion of scintillations here, but a few deflections on either side. That was the expectation. However, that's not what he got. So what happened was here is you have an alpha emitter and you would get, of course, some of them going through, a large number of going through, but occasionally you would get fine ones that were sim simply knocked way off at a different angle, returning, going off in a completely different direction. Now, Rutherford was very perplexed by that when Geiger and Marsden revealed the results. His quote is this, it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and it hit you. On consideration, I realized that this scattering backward must be the result of a single collision and when I made calculations, I saw that it was impossible to get anything of that order of magnitude 
unless you took a system in which the greater part of the mass of the atom was concentrated in minute nucleus. It was then I had the idea of an atom with a minute massive center carrying a charge. So let's unpack what he basically came up with. So here is our model over here of Thompson, and we know, of course, that that is no longer correct. So he came up with this idea that the atom really was a large sphere, but its vast amount of matter was concentrated in the core or in the nucleus, which what Rutherford called it. And he said that it would explain why the vast numbers of alpha particles would pass through this atom simply because it was empty space, but occasionally the repulsive forces, in this case the Coulomb forces, would cause the alpha particle to be repelled by the positive nucleus in the center. He came up with these four key points. So he, using his calculations, and we're not going to go into the calculations that he did, you can look that up if you like, he said the majority of the mass is in the nucleus, whose volume is about one-tenth of a trillionth of the volume of the atom. One way to liken it is imagine a large football stadium and placing a tennis ball right in the middle of the field. Well, the nearest electrons, the way Rutherford was seeing, was basically at the very edge of the football stadium and the rest was empty space. In number two, the nucleus was essentially the entire mass of the atom. He also argued that the nucleus was positively charged and that the amount of positive charge of the nucleus balanced the negative charges of the electrons. And finally, he said the electrons move around in empty space of the atom surrounding the nucleus. So what he devised here really is a model of the atom that we are very familiar with and is often referred to as a planetary model. Now this is just a diagrammatic form, it's not meant to be accurate, but it represents the often the model that we see, a central core nucleus with electrons spinning around it. However, this particular model has one big flaw. Can you work out what it is? Well, the one big flaw is, is that because the electron is moving in a circle, it is therefore undergoing circular motion, it is therefore having centripetal acceleration, and therefore that centripetal acceleration is constantly changing, it is accelerating. And because classical physics tells us that an accelerating electron should be releasing energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation, then the electron would be losing energy and therefore the electron should spiral in and eventually collide with the nucleus. Now we know that is not what happens, so something else is going on. But now we've taken a big step away from the initial idea of Dalton, that atoms are just our fundamental particle, to the plum pudding model, J.J. Thompson, now to the more common planetary model. However, the flaw means that we need a solution to that flaw, and that flaw is later resolved by Niels Bohr in 1913. But that is a subject of another video. I hope that has helped you understand Rutherford's gold foil experiment. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.